Oh, great turnout here. And um, I'm going to get right into the introduction so we have uh, the time with uh, the ambassador. I'm delighted uh, to have the opportunity to introduce a different kind of speaker here at the Econ Club. While Ambassador John Byerly comes to us from Washington, D.C., like so many other keynoters here, he's really one of West Michigan's own. And he's also Grand Valley's own as well. John's career spanned the world, but it began in Muskegon, where he graduated from Mona Shores High School and then came to Allendale in the early 70s to study foreign languages. While at Grand Valley, John learned French, German, and Russian. And just as important, he learned the truth of Mark Twain's observation that, quote, travel is fatal to prejudice, bickery, and narrow-mindedness. In his travels, the ambassador has seen so much history happen. Just look at how his life has unfolded after he graduated from Grand Valley in 1975 with a bachelor's degree in French. He earned a position in the U.S. Diplomatic Corps. He was a member of the U.S. delegation that negotiated reductions in the use of conventional weapons with the old Soviet Union. He served under the Secretary of State George Shultz and the Secretary of State James Baker at a critical time in world history, participating in the historic 1988 meeting in Moscow between Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev. He was a member of the diplomatic corps that witnessed the biggest event since World War II, the fall of the Berlin Wall. In newly liberated Eastern Europe, President George W. Bush appointed him to be our nation's ambassador to Bulgaria, and then the crown jewel of his assignments in 2008, when the U.S. Senate confirmed his nomination to be America's ambassador to the Russian Federation. In that capacity, John would represent President Bush and then President Obama over a period of four years, all while witnessing one of the most significant transformations in modern history. Russia was shredding the totalitarian legacy of communism and opened up economically, politically, and culturally for the first time in probably a thousand years. However, my son Gregory is stationed Kodiak Island in the Coast Guard in Alaska. He was deployed to the Arctic region this summer on the Coast Guard cutter Healy and observed significant Russian presence. So in 2016, do we see the current leadership in Russia returning to the policies and behaviors of the past? Well, we'll find out. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ambassador John Barley back to home. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow, it is, this is a big room. Everyone hear me all right? It's uh, really great to be home. Uh, Michigan is my home, Muskegon is my hometown, uh, but I spent a lot of time in Grand Rapids, enough to get lost when I walk around downtown now trying to find the Pantland Hotel. <laughs> but I still try, I still try. Uh, it's always a bit daunting to uh, try to cover the subject of Russia in uh, what I really will hope lasts a few minutes, maybe 20, 25 minutes, because I do want to leave time for some questions. I'm very curious to hear how you see Russia after having heard how I see Russia. Uh, and I thank Tom very much for that uh, generous introduction. It's uh, a little daunting sometimes to be uh, introduced as anything close to an expert on Russia, one of my predecessors as ambassador in Moscow in the 1950s was uh, introduced as an expert on Russia and said very quickly, there are no experts on Russia in the United States. There's only varying degrees of ignorance. <laughs> now that is true today, I would say, but it's also evident that there's no shortage of interest in Russia among the American people and I'm very glad to see that. I'm asked to speak a lot on Russia, and uh, I will say it is quite often to uh, a, a very full room like this. And if we manage to put the word Putin in the title of the talk, as we tried to at one point for this, it's an even bigger crowd usually. None of this is a surprise. I would say that except for Germany, no great power 
over the last hundred years has influenced the course of American foreign policy more than Russia. For much of the 20th century, a succession of American administrations struggled to establish some kind of modus vivendi with the Soviet Union, a country that posed a unique existential military threat to the United States and constituted our main rival for influence globally. Today, governmental relations between Moscow and Washington once again are dominated by patterns of disagreement and confrontation that are familiar from the Cold War period. And this causes Americans once again to question whether a productive, constructive relationship with Russia is really worth all of the aggravation that it seems to require to build it. And if it is, then exactly how we should be going about it. Russia's size, her geopolitical influence, enormous nuclear arsenal, natural resource base quickly elevate this to a national interest priority of the highest order. It's difficult to name a security challenge that we as Americans will face in the 21st century that we won't confront more effectively if we have support and cooperation from Russia, whether we're talking about nuclear proliferation, Islamic extremism, the Arctic, which we were talking with President Haas about just a minute ago. Conversely, if we're fighting against Russia on any of these or other global problems, then the, then the challenge is complicated tremendously. But is it really possible for Russia and the United States to find enough common ground to cooperate? Well, a brief review of US-Russia history over the past 200 years supports the thesis that perhaps these two countries are not inevitably destined to be perpetual adversaries. Russia and the United States now have enjoyed formal dip dip diplomatic relations for about 200 years. Our first ambassador was a young fellow named John Quincy Adams who went to Moscow in 1809 and really for the next century after that until the dawn of the 20th century, the relationship between Russia and the United States was largely peaceful and pragmatic. America backed Russia against Great Britain in the Crimea War. Russia supported Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War. Theodore Roosevelt negotiated the treaty that ended the war between Russia and Japan in 1905. He won the Nobel Peace Prize for that. And even despite the serious differences that we had developed with Russia by the time of the Second World War, we managed to put that aside and forge a very effective alliance against Nazi Germany in World War II. Over the past 200 years, the United States and Russia are practically unique among the great global powers in that we have never fought against each other in a war. Now, for most Americans, that fact is interesting but really not much more. For Russians, on the other hand, Russians whose national identity has been formed by years of invasion, warfare, other catastrophes, it counts for a lot more. In other words, for more than half of this 200-year period, positive relations between the United States and Russia were viewed as the normal state of affairs in both countries. The problem, of course, is that for the last half of the 20th century, that is to say the period of living memory for many of us in this room and many of the policymakers in both Washington and Moscow, the Soviet Union and the United States were bitter geopolitical rivals. That Cold War rivalry is the historical exception, not the rule, but the memories of that period, I'm sure you'll agree, and the images are very vivid to this day. If I were to pull off my shoe right now and start pounding it on the podium, images would, Im would uh, instantly be summoned up for many of the people in this room. And this exhort exerts a powerful influence on perceptions in both countries. In point of fact, however, even during the Cold War, even during some of the lowest points of the Cold War, there were evidences of pragmatic instincts that characterized US-Russia relations. Despite the fearsome nuclear arsenals that both sides amassed after the Second World War, we never used them. And even 
in the depth of the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, which a few of us in this room still remember. I was, I think, nine years old at the time. That served as something as a global near-death experience that convinced both sides to reduce the level of confrontation, to build nuclear hotlines, to sign treaties outlawing the testing of nuclear weapons in outer space. And most importantly, it led to direct negotiations to limit and ultimately reduce the, new, the nuclear arsenal on both sides, a nuclear arsenal which still to this day constitutes more than 90% of the nuclear weapons on the face of the earth. Both sides recognized that we had a global obligation to manage this relationship with its potential for total annihilation in the most responsible way that we could. And when levels of disagreement spiked, as they inevitably will, between continental great powers, a tendency to correct and to try to reduce tension usually kicked in. For me, this was illustrated nowhere more clearly than during the early 1980s, which coincided with my first tour in Moscow at the embassy as a young foreign service officer. My arrival in 1983 was marked by some of the worst rhetoric and con confrontations of the Cold War. Ronald Reagan gave his evil empire speech. Soviet fighter planes shot down a commercial airliner and killed 270 civilians. Arms control negotiations collapsed. And in both Washington and Moscow, the idea of a war between Russia and the United States suddenly didn't seem so far-fetched. But in the end, again, reason and pragmatism prevailed. Within four years, just as I was leaving Moscow at the end of that first tour, President Reagan made a speech in which he said he had concluded that he agreed with Margaret Thatcher, that Mikhail Gorbachev was somebody that America not only could, but would try to do business with. So in sum, for America, Dealing with Russia over the last 60 years has required a great deal of clear-eyed adaptability and a readiness to stay engaged, even through extended periods when the relationship is defined more by disagreement than by agreement, like now. This year, 2016, marks a quarter of a century since the Soviet Union collapsed. And these 25 years also have been marked by the familiar cycle of ups and downs that characterize the US-Soviet and US-Russia relationship. But through it all, through this 25-year period, there is one important thing that has remained steady. And that was the recognition by four successive American administrations, Bush 41, Clinton, Bush 43, and now Obama, that the United States has a vital, even an existential interest in working as actively as we can to support Russia's transition from that failed socio-political experiment of the 20th century to a modern, globally integrated society. That policy is firmly grounded in our self-interest. It recognizes that the new Russian Federation has inherited the Soviet nuclear arsenal, 50% of the nuclear weapons on the face of the earth, and that the people responsible for those weapons were trained to see them ultimately being used against the United States. It also recognized that Russia retains a veto in the UN Security Council, which gives it a vote and a veto on the most important political global questions of the day. And it also recognized that Russia is, in resource terms, a superpower. It also, quite frankly, feared the descent into chaos that has so often attended the collapse of empires throughout history. It sought to take advantage of the ab abrupt collapse of the Soviet Union to allow Russia and the US to begin to build a relationship based on shared interests, something that was just off the table beginning in 1945. And the most important achievement of that period came in the first decade of the relationship when the United States and Russia negotiated the secure transfer of nuclear weapons and materials out of Ukraine, out of Kazakhstan, out of Belarus, and established cooperative programs to upgrade security at nuclear installations. Imagine where we would be today if Ukraine, if Kazakhstan, 
still maintain nuclear weapons, and we were trying to negotiate with them as we have been with the Iranians, for example, to divest themselves of that. A very, very different world. Russia at that time also requested from the West, requested from the United States, and received a lot of technical assistance on a number of fronts. Uh, rescuing the pension system, creating new laws and new courts to deal with this new thing called free enterprise, which up until a few years earlier had been a punishable offense, a crime in Russia. I was very closely involved in much of that work during the 1990s. Did we in the United States make some mistakes along the way? Absolutely. We saw things happening inside of Russia, especially in terms of how the economic reforms were being carried out, that we might have been able to stop or even reverse. We had a lot more influence in those days than we had, than we have today. And I can tell you from the conversations I have with my Russian friends when I go back to Moscow, uh, in all candor, they will admit many, many mistakes that were made on the Russian side as well. I can't talk as much about that in public, though. Uh, anyway, I'm happy to talk about all of those more in detail during the Q&A if there's interest, but anticipating one question that probably will come up, uh, I am not among those who believe that it was a mistake to enlarge NATO. Anyway, for most of these 25 years, this post-Cold War era, as we call it now, there was a strong predisposition on the part of those of us who developed and implemented policy, both in Washington and, and in Moscow, to see the strategic paths of each country as being more convergent than divergent. I used to write a lot of joint communiques at the end of US-Russia summit meetings between Clinton and Yeltsin, between Obama and Putin in the early days. And I and my Russian colleagues would always find it easy in the communique to agree on the following sentence which became something of a, of a mantra for us. We would say, we seek a relationship in which we contain our inevitable disagreements and prevent them from doing damage to other areas of the relationship where we have constructive cooperation. In other words, we may not agree on the goals of the peace process between Serbia and Kosovo, but we are not going to stop the inspections we're carrying out of our nuclear reductions on both sides. Now, alas, we seem to have reached a point where I think it is fair to question how much we continue, can continue to count on that assumption. As we look at the confrontation between Russia and the West that was brought on by Russia's annexation of Crimea, by the fighting in southeastern Ukraine, by our persistent differences in Syria, it seems clear to me that we, in fact, are failing to contain our differences. And as a result, I would argue, we are running the risk of discarding the shared goal of strategic convergence and, more worrisome still, we're abandoning that steady engagement with Russia that is required to make any progress at all. We are reinforcing some of our old instincts to define each other as enemies. And that's a very dangerous road to go down. At work here, I see something deeper than just the latest cyclical downturn in US-Russia relations. I see several factors that represent serious changes in the geopolitical environment that put us, frankly, in uncharted territory. And some of these factors definitely will accelerate and reinforce the divergent trend lines. Others could possibly have a more constructive influence. But overall, the bottom line is that we need policies that are designed and implemented with much more skill and understanding of what is at stake for us as Americans than anything I hear out of any of the candidates in the current presidential debate. The first factor is the apparent determination of President Putin to set Russia on a new course, a course that firmly rejects the United States or Europe as any kind of a model or a mentor for Russia. In Russia, this is portrayed as our fault, 
It's portrayed as a response to America's failure to, to take account of Russia's interests, our disrespect for her culture and her values, our opposition to Russia's aspirations to be a great global power. This new course is a break with Russia's immediate post-Soviet politics, which did look at the West as something more of a partner. But it's far from a unique phenomenon in the course of Russian history. It echoes a struggle for dominance that has been going on inside of Russia for centuries between two competing internal camps. One camp, traditionally it was called the Westernizers, today I would call them the economic integrationists, I think. One camp defines Russia's success and identity somewhere in the context of a wider world, a wider Euro-Atlantic world. A second, much more conservative group, which today is dominated by leaders of Russia's military and security establishments, that group views the world beyond Russia's borders with suspicion and hostility and seeks to reclaim Russia's lost imperial might. Now, both of these groups are united by the goal of securing Russia, its status as a great global power, but they differ very, very sharply on ways to do that. For the conservative group, they want to create something called the Eurasian Economic Union as a kind of counterweight to the EU. The westernizers, on the other hand, see economic reform and integration with western structures as something of as a tool to fight against the corruption and the mismanagement and the inefficiencies that keep Russia down competitively and thus undermine her great power aspirations. So you have these two groups that have really fought it out historically throughout Russian history and they're doing it again now. And today, we have to say that it's evident that the anti-Western conservative camp has a firm grasp on the levers of power inside of Russia. And those hardliners appear determined to forge ahead with a redefinition of the country on Russia's terms. This does not, however, and we must not see this, however, as setting Russia on uh, an inevitably divergent trajectory from the United States. Both countries continue to share important interests. We have to admit that the objective realities of the 21st century with its open, interconnected communication are gonna hamper the efforts of conservatives who are promoting a very isolationist and exceptional view of Russia. However, we have to understand that this is a reality. It is a deeper and much more significant shift in the thinking and directing and direction of Russia's leadership than we've seen before. We are dealing with a Russia that perceives itself as recovered from the trauma and the weaknesses of the 1990s and is determined to set its own course. And the challenge for us is to ensure that this new course, which they will be on for a while, doesn't evolve and strengthen with anti-Americanism as one of its founding principles. It's no less important to engage this more assertive Russia toward internationally acceptable outcomes, as difficult as that might be, but it requires much more skill and much more effort to do so. So that's the first big change that makes this a different period. Russia is no longer seeing itself as a partner of the West. The second feature that I think sets this current confrontation apart from earlier downturns is the scale of the economic links that exist between Russia, the United States, and Europe, and the willingness to use and to threaten the use of these enormous levers in, co in coercive ways. I'm thinking about the actual size of the economic relationship between Russia and the United States, it's about $40 billion a year in terms of trade. With the European Union, 10 times that, about $400 billion. So together, the United States and Europe account for about half a trillion dollars in the Russian economy. China, by contrast, only does about $100 billion worth of trade. So that gives you an idea of the scope and scale of the economic relationship, which didn't exist 25 years ago. And the economic sanctions that we're now levying against Russia in response for Ukraine and Crimea are really nothing new. We tried economic sanctions back in the 1980s after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. They didn't work because the trade volumes were small, 
and we didn't have the Europeans with us at that point. Today, that situation has changed radically. And the dependence of Russia's largest corporations today, both state-owned and private, the dependence of those corporations on Western credits, credits from Western banks, has now reached levels that make the cutoff of those credits a serious punitive sanction in ways that I think none of us recognized even three or four years ago when we went down this road. President Putin, for the first time about a month ago, admitted in an interview to a German magazine that Western economic sanctions were doing serious harm to the Russian economy. And although the impact of those sanctions has been somewhat overtaken now by the catastrophic fall in the price of oil, Russia gets about 40 to about 65 percent of its income from the sale of hydrocarbons. Even though oil prices are now probably more important than sanctions, Washington and Brussels have sent a powerful message to Russia through the effective coordination of their efforts. But while we have had an influence on Russia's economy, have we had an influence and effect on Kremlin decision making? There, I think it's a little less apparent. In fact, the sanctions have actually strengthened the arguments of the anti-West hardliners that Russian integration with the global economy is, is a poison chalice that's aimed at weakening Russia and making it more dependent on the outside world. And now at a time when Russia is headed into a very, very sharp recession, tightening sanctions provides the Kremlin with a convenient external scapegoat for the economic problems in the country which are really internally the fault of corruption and mismanagement. And this is a real dilemma for policymakers, both in Brussels and in Washington, since the resort to sanctions and continuing with sanctions risks undoing some of the trade and economic ties, which I think have constituted one of the best success stories of Russia's transition over the past 25 years. On the one hand, sanctions can and probably do influence the Kremlin's policy choices. On the other hand, they undermine the strategic goal of seeing Russia continue to integrate itself economically. This is truly new, uncharted territory, and it remains a huge challenge for Washington and Brussels, not only to get right, but to stay together on. The third and the final difference that I see, and I'll stop on this, is the one that I think offers some cause for optimism, that these divergent trajectories we've been talking about won't continue uncorrected into the medium or long term. I'm talking about the evolution that has taken place over the past 25 years within Russia's society itself. To an extent unprecedented in their history, Russians are now connected to the world around them, the global economy, the information space, international education in a way that has changed not only how they view the outside world, but more importantly, what their expectations are about their own internal governing system. Russians on average now make about 35 million trips abroad per year. A generation ago, that figure would have sounded hallucinatory. Many tens of thousands of Russians are now employed by American and European companies. Some of them may even be in this room. The head of Boeing Moscow is a Russian. By some estimates, there are 40,000 Russians living and working in just the high-tech clusters in and around Silicon Valley. Despite the high volume of anti-Western rhetoric that's coming out of the state-run media in Russia now, the high volume of student applications from Russians to attend universities and colleges in the United States and Europe is also very high. The past decade has seen tremendous integration, tremendous growth in interactions between Russian scientific, technological, and educational institutions with their European and American counterparts. It has, in short, I would argue, become almost impossible to imagine how Russia could cut itself off from the sweep of global trends and influences, no matter how much these conservatives want to paint Russia as an alternative to what they perceive as a decayed, amoral West. The objective realities of this interconnected, open 21st century that we've been talking about simply 
are not favorable in the long term to this mythology of a threatened, insecure Russia that's been at the heart of reactionary rhetoric. So even as we and our European allies rightly oppose the action of Russia's current leadership, as we make it clear that they will and they must pay a price for their aggression against their neighbors, it is essential that we maintain and even strengthen our ties with Russia's civil society, with its intellectual community, with its economic and political institutions. However illegitimate we find some of the Kremlin's current policies, and illegitimate they certainly are, Russian society is diverse, and we further our own interests and desires for positive change by finding ways to stay engaged with that substantial body of Russians who see their country's future linked in some sort of productive or constructive way with the United States. I was talking to a good friend of mine about this last summer. He's a uh, senior executive with a major Michigan company that's been doing Russia, doing business in Russia since the 1930s. And we were trying to find a way to, we both agreed that what I've just said is something that's right, but very hard to explain to the American people. And he's a very facile guy, and I said, what, come up with a bumper sticker. On what, how do you explain what we've just said? He said, simple. Don't give in to Putin, but don't give up on Russia. The internal conflict among the Russian people to define their country's destiny and their place in the world is likely to continue, and I would say probably for decades. And the existential stake that we as Americans have in the right outcome of that internal conflict, or at least avoiding the worst case outcomes, I think should be self-evident to all of us. So what's required above all for all of us is a better understanding of the complex processes that are at work inside of Russia and a steady resolve on our part, on the part of our leaders, to stay engaged with the people and the institutions who see Russia's destiny linked responsibly and productively with the outside world. In the end, we shouldn't be betting against that pragmatic instinct that I described characterizing U.S.-Russia relations. We should be investing in it. Thanks very much for your attention, and I look forward to hearing your reactions and questions to what I've had to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. And we have about 10 minutes for Q&A. So who's ready to go first? Please. How long is uh, Putin likely to stay in power, and who does he have in the bench? Uh, according to the Russian Constitution, Putin, by law, can remain president for another eight years. He has two years left on the end of his current term that he was elected to in 2014, and he can stand for, and probably would win, the next election in 2018, which would take him to, what, 2024, at which point uh, Vladimir Putin will be 73 years old. Not very old for uh, statesmen these days. Uh, will Putin last that long? That's uh, a question a lot of people ask and analyze. My own view on that is the following. Uh, for a number of reasons, President Putin enjoys a great deal of popularity in Russia today. His first eight years as president between 2000 and 2008 coincided with the most amazing uh, increase in disposable incomes in Russia in its history. It also coincided with the tripling, uh, almost quadrupling of the price of oil, so Mr. Putin had a bit of help in raising the incomes of his people, but he's still given a lot of credit for that. Russia now is facing a situation where they'll probably be in a deficit and in a recession for at least the next two years. Uh, 
Will the Russian people blame President Putin for the diminution in their standard of living, inevitably, that they will see over the next two years? We really don't know the answer to that. But we do know that President Putin and the people around him are very skilled at manipulating the information environment that Russians draw their perceptions of their leadership from. So I would not really bet against uh, President Putin's remaining in power until 2024. And part of the reason for that is the answer to your second question, who does he have on the bench? No one who has ever been allowed to rise high enough to pose a real challenge to him. Other questions? Uh, the question is, uh, how is the current Russian uh, policy vis-a-vis -vis Syria, support for President Assad, uh, interfering with our own efforts to bring peace in the region, and could it lead to uh, a new Cuban Missile Crisis of the 21st century? Uh, a very big question. Russia currently has a, a sizable contingent of air assets in Syria and for the last two, three months has been conducting uh, an air campaign, a bombing campaign directed mostly at uh, the military forces that oppose President Assad. Why is Russia doing that? I'd say there are quickly three reasons. Uh, first, because they can. One of the things that President Putin made a priority of his first 14 years in power was rebuilding the Russian military in a way that would allow it to begin to project power, not on the scale that America does, but certainly more than Russia could after the Soviet Union fell apart. What we saw in Georgia during the invasion of 2008, what we saw and are seeing now in Southeast Ukraine, is part of that, but those Russian military assets need to wear camouflage on their, uh, on their insignias. In Syria, the Russian Sukhoi bombers are out for all to see. The Russian military advisors are wearing their uniforms and their flags, and the message very much is Russia is back in a military sense. So that's one reason. Second reason is that Russia feels very, very strongly that America's policies over the past 10 years of essentially picking winners and losers in the Middle East, dispensing with the losers, and then letting things fall where they may has created chaos. They blame us for the chaos in Iraq. They blame us for the chaos in Syria. They are arguing that if we get rid of Assad without a good sense of what follows him, we'll create chaos there as well. That's the second reason. The third reason is Russia's traditional, almost historic view of its mission in the Middle East. And this goes back quite a ways. In 1774, 1774, ships of the Imperial Russian Navy bombed Beirut, which at that point was a fort. Thank you so very much for, for absolutely fascinating, thought-provoking uh, speech ab about um, some very, very, very topical uh, um, themes. I would like now to ask um, David Hooker, uh, the president of uh, Meyer Garden, um, and Cleves Whitney, the director of the Hauenstein Center at, um, for Presidential Studies at GVSU, as well as uh, the president of GVSU, back to the podium um, for a special presentation. Thank you, Birgit, very much. It's great to uh, share the stage with Ambassador Byerly. Welcome back home. And also with the, I should say, the uh, director of the uh, Board of Trustees, chairman of the Board of Trustees at Grand Valley, and my boss. So thank you all for being here. You know, uh, this is really an important celebration of a life for us at the Hauenstein Center. It's just about everybody in this room knows that we lost a remarkable human being about a month ago. Ralph Hauenstein was our North Star at the Hauenstein Center and at Grand Valley. 
And you know, you heard a lot of comment yesterday, Super Bowl Sunday, 170 million people around the world, 180 different countries. They're watching that Super Bowl and they hear a lot of comments about most valuable players, impact players. Well, Ralph Howenstein was our impact player in every sense of the world. Of course, you don't measure a life by the number of years, necessarily. Ralph passed away just two months shy of his 104th birthday, so it was an impressive life in terms of length. But it was also impressive in terms of the, the quality of the impact he made on so many people in this room and the institutions you represent and the lives and the friendships that he formed. If you go back and look at Ralph as an impact player, think of him in the 1930s when he was standing up for the rights of African Americans in his Civilian Conservation Corps. Look at the impact Ralph made in the 1940s when he was in World War II under Eisenhower, the Director of, in of Intelligence, and he was rolling back the Nazis from continental Europe. Think of the impact Ralph had in the 1950s when he was beginning an entrepreneurial career. And he had a remarkable impact if you just add up the things that he did in the food business, the machines he made, the food that he made possible, the food he moved around. Ralph fed millions of people, including in the developing world, and he taught them how to feed themselves. And then you look at what Ralph Hallenstein did in the 1960s when he began a remarkable philanthropic career. And there's so many of our institutions here in town that reflect that career. We're proud to carry on his legacy, whether it was through libraries, universities, medical uh, facilities. Ralph touched so many of us in so many ways, and perhaps that's the biggest legacy of all. Ralph was an impact player in our lives personally, and we will always honor him for that. Certainly at Grand Valley, we do. Back in 2010, the president of Grand Valley, Tom Haas, had a conversation with Ralph Hallenstein that was very important. He wanted to honor Ralph. Ralph was going on toward his 100th birthday, and Grand Valley was going on toward its 50th birthday. And Tom and Ralph decided to set up a fellowship in Ralph's name, the Colonel Ralph W. Hallenstein Fellowship, to honor Ralph in perpetuity. And it would become the most prestigious honor that we at the Hallenstein Center can confer. And the purpose of that fellowship is to confer a, the honor to people who've had a decisive impact on our nation and often on our world. People who've had an impact, you know, just as a, a game-changing impact, people who've made a difference, and we see it in the headlines of the papers. And we're so proud of the, the work that Ambassador Byerly has done on behalf of our nation. Not only the distinguished resume, but if you look at the difference he made and the values he projects, the value, for example, of service to one's nation, the debt we owe to our country that has helped us be who we are, the value of taking the time and the effort. This is a polyglot. This is a man who knows five or six languages fluently. The effort it takes to learn those foreign languages and to be a cultural bridge builder, that's a remarkable amount of effort. The values that he showed in when he's sitting at the table opposite Putin and projecting really what this country stands for, and the fact that he learned about prudent diplomacy, not just blind diplomacy for its own sake, but really understanding that great diplomacy is the best alternative to war. Well, these are the values that are embodied in today's recipient. And at the Hallenstein Center, we are very proud to offer the Colonel Ralph W. Hallenstein Fellowship to Ambassador John Byerly. I don't have to give another speech, but I do want to make a few final 
observations, or let's call them recognitions. There are three people in this room who played a formative role in getting me to where I am now, wherever that is. Bill and Mary Seeger, two professors of German at Grand Valley State Colleges in 1974, who, 72 actually when I came, who uh, took a kid from uh, Muskegon, a little green behind the ears, I think, uh, and began to introduce him to the wider world and also drilled him on the grammar of German in a way that's still stuck to this day. And Christine Rydell, uh, my professor of Russian, the woman who taught me Russian, and more importantly, when I was a junior and for some dumb undergraduate reason I dropped Russian, Christine tracked me down, it wasn't too hard, we were all in uh, the upstairs, what was it, Lake Huron Hall in those days, and said, what are you doing? Why did you do that? And I said, well, I'm busy and I have other things. And she, essentially having convinced me to start Russian in the first place, pulled me back off the plank when the chips were down. I owe a lot to Grand Valley and I owe a lot to those three people. Thank you very much. <laughs>